Welcome to chapter 10, in which we are going to look at the role of the customer in the production service and the idea of in services marketing, where we capitalize on co-creation and co-production, and we really integrate the employee the employee role into the consumption role. And this has raised a few ethical debates over the years in uh, services marketing about the extent to which the immersion of the customer in the production of the product should result in a higher or lower price tag, uh, the ethics of requiring partial employee status for someone to get the most value out of their service product, and a few other questions in terms of uh, even things like the intellectual property aspect of if a customer as an expert customer co-produces something that can be then replicated by the firm, who has the rights to that particular action and activity? Uh, this becomes even more prevalent when we start getting into uh, paid community-based activity, when we start looking at the roles of the experts consumer as a mentor of the novice consumer. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff here that we're only going to skim the surface. There's a lot more that becomes uh, a question of your ethics, your strategy and your approach and the organization's approach and how they want to engage. So it should be considered that this is, again, another part of services is the constant and ongoing use of spectrums rather than isolated standalone. The novice to expert to expert performer. Uh, what you are looking at here is that the novice is someone who is new to the process or new to the product. If you engage in service development, uh, you change the service process, your expert customers will revert back to novices. Uh, if you change to a certain level where uh, previous behaviors that worked for you before, yeah, for example, if you take a, uh, a gym which was previously a self-service 24-hour gym and make it a uh, staffed and serviced nine to five gym, weekdays gym, your expert customer who was rocking up doing their own thing at three o'clock in the morning has suddenly found themselves not only not just a novice, but not entirely certain they know how to use the new service. Similarly, if you've gone from a service that was co-produced through staff and employer, uh, customer alike, then you'll find that if you were to pull the staff out, so you've gone from a full service operation, everyone trained at the gym was paired with an instructor to the venue is now just here, go for it, do what you want. Uh, your expert customers who had a really good working relationship with their trainers will find themselves now going, um, how do I, how do I gym? Uh, and they will move back down to novice. So. It's not a permanent position. It's not a once you attain this many hours on the service, you are an expert or expert performer or an expert customer. So it should be thought of as a sliding scale and one where even as an expert performer, if you know how the service production process works, uh, you can play your role in it and you can integrate yourself into it. You may find changes in the service. You may find upgrades to technology, or just passage of time for you as the expert performer might result in a change of status. It may be that you've been doing this for long enough that you've forgotten some of the basics uh, and that you know, the service you are creating doesn't necessarily fit, but you're picking up, you're compensating. So there's a whole bunch of things to be considered here is that this is uh, about understanding both the objective skills of the employee and where the, of the customer and where the customer sees themselves. And I keep accidentally saying employee because I keep thinking partial employee because this is how the customer frameworks when I trained as 
a services marketer, we refer to this part of engaging consumers in the production process as partial employees. So even as the expert performer, expert customer theoretically of services marketing, I am still thinking about an older definition, an older technique. So the customer performance and operational efficiency, there's a couple of things here is if you have a very high contact system, uh, where there's a lot of human interaction, you may find a high skill, high skill customer has less efficiency because they're not going to follow the script as much. Whereas on a low contact system, uh, where there's a lot of automation, where there's a lot of routine, that a customer with a lot of experience can start punching in the, you know, if you're looking at a telephone tree of press one to press two to that sort of thing, the customer knows the routine, they can punch in the codes and be at the point in the phone system that they want to be at before the mechanical voice has explained to the new customer what the first set of options are. Similarly, uh, performance and operational efficiency, this is one of the things you've got to be really careful about in a services marketing design, is to what extent you are dependent on your customer getting it right first time and sticking to a script and enacting on a script. To that end, we talk about uh, in employee roles, we talk about service scripts and service roles. Because employee the employee quite often is required to engage a script with a co-actor, with a with a customer who is playing a counter role in the script. That you will have moments where you're going to have to teach the customer their role. Uh, if anyone's ever rung a phone helpline you have to just write out the first 10 questions or however many questions it is on the script until such time as the script is satisfied that you are in a position to go off script. Uh, there's also the elements where in terms of if the customer is used to a certain level of routine in the performance, a performance script is going to increase satisfaction because the customer will feel that they have a greater locus of control they know what's going on, they know what's happening. The one from professional experience problem with a, a service script is when your customer is better at your service script because they are a more, they've been with your firm longer than your employee has, is when it throws the employee as you are a customer going through the steps, but you're doing it faster than they can or that they're used to. So you are selecting all the options before the questions have been asked because you already have your answer because you're a regular customer. So scripting can have, uh, scripting's got pros and cons. The other thing with uh, an expected script is if it's a search-based service, search, search attribute service, it's going to be a lot easier to run with a script and use a script. If it's a experiential there will be a lot of scripting, but part of the script is to create the opportunity for the customer to do something unique, do something novel for themselves. And if you're at the far end of the spectrum on services which are fully, intent, fully inconsistent, highly customized, and people even at the end aren't sure what took place, scripts may not be of any use to you or scripts may be super valuable on the entry and exit points in the service to give the customer a sense that it's all under control. Now in terms of managing customer performance, uh, things that you're looking at here are, you want to know how good your customers are at performing the service. And then you want to be thinking about, do you want expert customers? Because if you've got expert performers, is it going to give you a revenue premium? Is having someone who's better, someone who knows the secret menu, 
someone who can customize things without thinking about it, are they going to be a more efficient product? Are they going to consume the product more efficiently? Are they going to get in, get out faster so you can throughput more, more clients? Are they going to pay a premium? What is the value of the expert to you in your service design? Uh, this is also where we want to pull in the seduction model and really think about the aspects, uh, particularly other customers. Prime customer and other customers, you may be able to on-sell the value of the customer's expertise in a way that allows them to not just cope with rookies and novices and new customers, but to adopt them, to take them on as apprentices, uh, to have them join the expert customer so that there's more uh, opportunity. And lastly on this, where we're going to talk a bit about uh, customer scripts and managing customer uh, performance. Once you establish customer scripts, you've got to be really careful about how you change them uh, so that you don't end up creating experts and then pulling that expertise from them. If you do that a few times, you'll create the cognitive dissonance as to why should I invest, why should I learn the new rules, why should I do this in a new way, because it's just going to change, there's no point in me getting invested or being uh, a key part. Expertise is valuable, it's useful, but only if it's integrated into your service design as to this is the role I would like a rookie, mid-level experience, early uh, product consumption, late mid product consumption, late product consumption, expert product consumption. If you think about them from market segmentation, if you think about customer performance and customer expertise as a segmentation variable and utilize that to create different experiences based on expertise, there's a lot of opportunity there. In terms of uh, managing a performance script, again, we, we, we'll look at this from the point of view of trying to create the expert. Uh, again, this is where the other customer comes in. Uh, this is where loyalty and satisfaction link in to people coming back to the service often enough to make it of value to them. Where we start thinking of partial employee as a role, uh, the unpaid partial employee volunteer who is a regular customer and a sufficiently veteran customer that they can be given a role and a responsibility and a reward both intrinsic and extrinsic for supporting the new customers. And the last thing is you want to be watching here uh, the clash between veterans and experts and rookies. When we talk about seduction and we talk about the other customer and most people didn't prioritize other customers as a means uh, in the seduction model, how do we deal with the frustration experienced by the veteran when the newcomer who's fumbling their way through the menu, they're unfamiliar, they're needing to seek advice, how do we balance that for the experienced customer who doesn't want to take on the role of mentor, supervisor, or advisor to other customers. They just want their service super fast because get out the way, I know what I'm doing. So we again, all about ensuring that this factor, the knowledge of the performance scripts, the expertise name, performing the scripted role in the service, fits to that element of seduction in terms of the other customers and your role you choose to play. So a couple of things, um, also in the service experience and customer expectation, we want to talk about waiting time. Uh, there are some mission critical uh, wait time questions, but they all, not all, but a huge chunk of them, more than 50%, come down to the locus of control. When we as people feel we are in control, there is a better sense of willingness um, to wait, to queue, to do 
do other things. So the quick ones here to, uh, there's one I want to draw on, which is the pre-process, post-process. Certainty is important. Certainty begets uh, the sense of control. Uh, if you say, this will take 10, you know, please hold, we'll be back to you in 10 minutes. You're also setting up an expectation, and that expectation can be satisfied, delighted, or missed. Uh, if you explain the nature of the delay and why there is a delay, uh, that will help. If the delay can be, if the tension around the delay can be reduced by activating other aspects, uh, particularly here, if you are, if there is the opportunity to pre-process and engage, uh, so someone's come to your service, they want to use your service, there's a long queue, there's a long wait, but you send people down the queue to start pre-filling out forms or pre-processing things, that's going to reduce the overall sense of, you know, I know I have moved into the queue, I know I have started to activate the process. Uh, the waiting period before the pre-service waiting period has a different perceptual element. Uh, In-process delays can be built into the service design that you know you're going to have, you're gonna bring 144 people into a restaurant, there are 12 tables of 12. If you make it clear that we're gonna start filling up by table one and we're gonna start delivering by table one, then the people at table 12 know that, okay, when I see food at table 10, it's nearly my time. If there's no sense and things are sort of going randomly, people will be uncertain. Uncertainty does not help. But the final aspect here is post-process. When the job is done, the show is done, you just want to pay the money and get out. You are trying, you are willing to, during the service process, delegate control of the circumstances to the firm. As soon as the service is over, you're basically trying to pick your life up and move on to the next point, regain your locus of control. So your sequence is pre-process, pre post-process, minimizing those. If you need to, if you know that delays are an inevitable part, the way the service is produced, build them into the design, build them into the service blueprint, create holding points, create delay points where a portion of a service is undertaken. For example, if you know that you have a finite event, uh, you can throughput 40 people onto a ride, the ride takes two minutes, and every th three minutes, you'll be able to put a ride through. One minute to load, two minutes for the ride, one minute to load the next one. You know that it's going to take time for that people to get through that queue. Put waypoints and marker points, put events, put interactive elements, line the queue up as part of the pre-service, get people engaged, get people part of the process, get people starting to co-create their experience before they get to the experience you're providing. So the thing about uh, queues are not inherently a bad thing, Cues that are not used and not capitalized on are a bad thing. And the final elements are fairness and equity are an important element here. We've got to have a sense that we've all arrived at the service and if one person's getting service ahead of the rest of us uh, and we can't determine why. Uh, similarly, I've talked about the queuing. Unoccupied waits feel longer than occupied. Thankfully, most of us have mobile phones now, so pre- so customer co-production of occupied weights is a lot higher. But at the same time, if you can put something into the service environment that allows pre-processing, self-service pre-processing, self-service queue allocation, these create a sense of, I have exerted control. But the flip side is down at the bottom, queuing 
and value are connected. The more valuable and exclusive the service is, the longer people will wait. That people line up for hours outside nightclubs, restaurants, the hottest bar in town, etc., etc. There is a value to being seen in the queue if there is a social message attached to I am attending the service. So it's always, again, the queuing process, the waiting time, the delays times, factor it in to make it a part of the value offer. And the customer performance. So this is the uh, final aspect for the, the chapter is what you are looking for in terms of customer participation is the more you are going to rely on the customer, the more you have to interact with the customer to give them the skills and the training to be able to get their value. And this is one of the aspects we talked about um, there is an, in co-creation, is that there's also an alternate version of the marketing mix. Uh, it's the Dev and Schultz 2004 uh, SIVA. Solution, Information, Value, and Access. And in the SIVA model, access is the ability of the customer, inclusive of skills, talents, and physical requirements, to be able to extract the offered value from the product. And in services marketing, what we can do is that we can plan in to teach, train, and otherwise create the environments where part of the value offer of the product is not just the locus of control that comes from the skill set, but the upskilling of a customer into our service protocols. The creation of a sense of control, sense of skill that comes from being able to co-produce the product with the firm because you have been taught by the firm how to engage. So again, this will be, you look back at your service blueprint, you look at your co-creation of value, you look at uh, the four pillars marketing, do you want the consistency? Do you want to provide a framework through consistency, through scripts, technology, and other protocols that lets the customer feel in control through the application of their skills? And finally, it's going to be an HRM aspect as well, is if you are massively co- you're basically conscripting your customers to become partial employees, you've got to watch for what your requirements, your expectations are, your accessibility elements. There are a bunch of different ways in which this can be super beneficial to your firm, but there are also minimum standards and requirements you're going to need to reach. Again, it's about your customer, knowing your customer's needs, and working out how can you integrate that into what you offer as a service provider so that you're getting value, the customer's coming to your firm consuming your product, and the customer's getting value. They are getting to exert control, influence, a whole bunch of the psychological uh, elements of intangible value and benefits to themselves that are coming from partially producing the product that they've come out to purchase. So draw on your CB theory, draw on your HRM theory, look at leadership, look at management, look at all the ways in which people are engaged and managed and supported and look then to how do I integrate that into my services design? Where do I put that in my service blueprint?